Hello, welcome to the first video in this series that uh, my son Chucky uh, gives me a topic that he wants to know about and then I tell him about that topic over YouTube videos. Uh, for this video, Chuck, uh, you wanted to know about Black Widow spiders. So I already knew a handful of information about Black Widow spiders simply because I know some about spiders and I know some about Black Widows living in Indiana uh, for 30 some years. You need to know what is and what is not around spider-wise. Um, now, I did go online and I pulled up some more information just to make sure what I already thought I knew was correct. And I also had some other interesting information that I didn't know yet. So we'll both be learning this week uh, facts about black widows. Uh, because I did go online and I am using an external reference for some of that information, uh, I'll go ahead and post a link below with that website that I pulled information off of. So that way, Charles Hannum and Denny M. Miller of Virginia Tech uh, get their share of credit for the information provided. Now, thank you to them, but I doubt if they'll ever see this video. But still, got to thank them. Got to cite your sources. Got to be a responsible individual when pulling information off the Internet. All right, to start us off, let us talk about species information of black widow spiders. All right, so there's 31 species of black, well, what they're called widow spiders, and then all 31 found around the world. Um, the widow spider falls under the scientific classification of arthropoda for their phylum, which means that they're arthropods. Now, arthropods include different classes, uh, such as arachnids, insects, myriapods, and crustaceans. All right. In that phylum, uh, all spiders fall under uh, arthropoda. Uh, so it's not just about black widows at this point. This is a much broader classification. So when you say arthropoda, it could mean any of the previously listed. It can mean any kind of shrimp, uh, crab, insect, praying mantis, that kind of stuff. Um, then once you get more specific, it gets further down. So right now we're in a general classification uh, that includes all spiders. Um, under that phylum, you go to the class. Now class is the different level and uh, the class that black widows, spiders, fall under is arachnida or arachnids. Simple way to call them. Um, there are a few more classification steps that occur between phylum, class, order, family, genus as you go down, but I'll skip those. Simply stick to the basic classification scheme because you could do an entire video that could take easily an hour or more just to define different sub and supergroups included in scientific classification of a single species. So, um, Class of arachnida includes animals like mites, ticks, scorpions, uh, daddy long legs, which aren't actual spiders, but they're closely related. Obviously, they're in arachnida. Um, the, the, let's see, vinegaroons, which are also called whip scorpions, and whip spiders. Uh, each of these animals listed are all arachnids, but they fall under different orders. Now, orders is the next step down. Uh, the order in which spiders fall is Arrhenii I or Arrhenii E, depending on which way you want to pronounce it. Uh, a lot of the Latin names have different pronunciations depending on who's saying it. So, whatever floats your boat. Um, so, after you get to the order Arrhenii I, of which I'm going to say, uh, we finally reach the level that all true spiders fall under. So, not just arachnids in general, but spiders. Uh, now, to get more specific on a black widow, to black widow species, You've got to go down further in the grouping the classifications. Uh, so you get into families and then genus, and then after that is species. Um, so for the family that black widows belong to is called Theridiidae or Theridiidae. Once again, pronunciation depends on who's saying it. So I'm going to say Theridiidae. Uh, Theridiidae are known as comb-footed or cobweavers. Uh, within this family, widows are part of the Latrodecteris, or what, I'm sorry, Lactodectus, Latin is hard, Latrodectus genus. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, from there, each individual species has a second name added after you say Latrodectus. So it's Latrodectus this or Latrodectus that to distinguish each species from each other uh, past that in the genus. Uh, so now that we've gotten down to the actual widows, uh, we'll talk about the kinds that you could possibly encounter in the U.S. Um, there are five species of widow spiders that are endemic or native to the United States. Uh, these are the red widow, brown widow, and then you've got the western black widow, southern black widow, northern black widow, and that's all based off of direction. So basically there's the red, black, brown, and black, and then of the blacks you've got the western, northern, and southern. Um, the red and brown widows are found mainly in Florida, but there have been some uh, brown widows found as far west as Texas, so kind of that general area. Generally, reds stay in Florida. So from there, um, the western black widow can be found, as the name implies, west in the western portion of the U.S., basically from the Mississippi west. Now, I'm not using them as saying that there's none at all east of the Mississippi. There could be. Uh, I mean, we've got bridges and boats and all this other stuff going back and forth all the time. It would not be impossible for a western black widow to be on the east side of the Mississippi River, but I wouldn't say that they're going to be too far into the eastern side of the river, uh, just in the general area. But from the Mississippi all the way to the west coast, western black widow spiders. All right. So, and with that one, the name dictates where it lives. Similarly, you've got the northern and southern black widows, their names implying where they live. So the northern black widows would be north of the eastern side of the United States and southern on the south. And and that's going to be more dictated by temperature, maybe. Uh, specifics I didn't get into. Um, now, there are no lines, specific lines, saying, okay, this is where northern are and this is where southern are. There is range overlap. Um, you've got some states like Virginia. Virginia is a native habitat for both the northern and southern black widow species. So, further on about the black widow, the widow spider is the most venomous, venomous spider in North America. Now, they're considered venomous, not poisonous, because their toxins, or venoms, come from their bite. Uh, a poisonous creature, on the other hand, would introduce toxins to a creature, or, or to you, through more passive means, such as if you ate it, or you touched it, like with a poison dart frog, or some species of jellyfish, or eating pufferfish. Um, uh, poison is more, um, you do it to yourself. Uh, toxin is something, or uh, venom is something that's done to you, like animals use a venom to bite like that. It's a little bit more in depth, but that's just an easy way to remember it. So, from there, let's talk about what they look like. All right, I gave you five different species of black widows. Five, all right? Well, of widows, not black widows. Five different species of widows that live in the U.S. So, let's break down the basics of what they have in common. So, widow, just like all spiders, has two main body sections. These are the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Cephalothorax, big word, not really that complicated. It's basically the top half of the spider um, from midsection to the front. So on the cephalothorax, you're going to find the head of the spider, little spider face, all of the eyes, and all eight legs. All eight legs are attached to the cephalothorax. Then you've got the abdomen. Now it's the big section on the back end. Um, you probably just say it's the butt of the spider. I mean, it looks like a large butt. Um, now, pretty cut and dry on that. Not much attached to it. And on the sides or anything, just a big round part on the rear. Now, there are appendages that come off of it, but they're very, very, very tiny, and they're at the very, very, very end. Now, these are called the spinnerets. 
Uh, these appendages are used to make and excrete silk that they use in their webs. Uh, spinnerets, uh, they're, they look different. Uh, their appearance can differ between the different genuses of spiders. Um, I mean, some spiders have six, some have two, some have four. Just depends on what species of the spider. Um, and also their appearance and how many they have also dictates what kind of webs they make. Um, so widow spiders, for example, don't make the big ornate round spider webs, the geometric patterns that you'd see, you know, on, on a door frame or between branches uh, outside. Uh, the, the webs that they make, like their name implies, you know, cob, cob weavers are cobwebs or just masses of spider silk. So it's just that tangly mess that you just find in a corner somewhere. That's, that's more akin to what a black widow would make. Um, so these masses will stretch across a small space, um, generally low to the ground. From one side will be a stationary object, just something that doesn't move something, so that way they don't have to worry about their web being ripped away or something. And then on the other end will be a small recessed area, something like a crack, hole, something that the spider can fit in. Now this hole is where the spider will spend all of its time. It'll weave the web and then it'll go sit in its hole and it will keep its little spider legs out on some of the web lines so that way when any insects, another spider something gets caught in its web, it'll feel the vibrations come out, bite, and then catch it, kill it, and then suck all of its juices out. Um, now, about the way it looks. Um, Black Widow, it's a relatively small spider. Uh, females are larger than males, too. So if the female's small, males are even smaller. Males are roughly half the size of a female. Um, and then you go to the, the females, uh, they're, if you look at their legs, when their legs are all stretched out, it could be around one and a half inches, which is about that. Uh, with its legs spread out. But if you look at the body, because it's not often that you see a, a spider all splayed out like this. Um, but when you talk about their bodies, their bodies are generally around half an inch long, so small. Um, and like I said, males are even smaller than that. So, but we're mostly focused on females in this next section right here. So um, the female black widow is the one that's considered to be dangerous to humans. Uh, males and the juveniles or young widow spiders are slightly less likely to, to cause a, uh, to be aggressive. That's, that's the word. Um, they don't really bite at all. So you don't really have to worry about them. They're not the ones defending a, an egg sac or whatnot. I mean, they still have enough venom that potent enough to kill Insects for hunting their prey, but they're not really going to do any damage to a human. Um, now back to the females. Black uh, female black widow is most easily identified by the bright red hourglass shape on their underside of their abdomen. That's the the big the butt shape. Uh, so this applies uh, mostly to the western and southern black widows, but it is important to note that the hourglass may not be a full hourglass. Um, it may be separated into two triangular parts separate from each other. So one point down, one point up, a little black space in the center. Um, not all spiders look identical. They're going to look about the same, but, but that's all dependent on species as well. Um, for instance, uh, the northern Northern Black Widow, uh, almost never has an hourglass shape on its stomach. Even though it's Black Widow, it doesn't have that telltale hourglass on it. Uh, instead, it will have two red bars where the hourglass should be. So instead of triangles, you got two lines. Um, along with that, uh, 
accompanied by red bars on the top of the abdomen as well. So not just marked on the bottom, marked on the back. And that's the northern black widow. Uh, many females of all species will also have an orange or red spot directly above the spinnerets on the top of their abdomen, so right at the back. Um, and that's for black widows and red widows and brown widows. Uh, the red widow females have the same body structure as black widows, but not a uh, reddish cephalothorax, but have a reddish cephalothorax, so red up front and more of a dark red or brown abdomen to the back. Um, they also have the red hourglass shape distinct on their uh, underside of their abdomen. Uh, but in some cases, once again, not all spiders are identical. So you could just have, instead of the hourglass structure, just two red splotches. It happens. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Similarly, brown widow females, brown widows, like red widows, are not black, hence the name. Brown widow females are a brownish color, as their name implies, and they do have the hourglass on their undersides. Uh, this one uh, appears to mostly have, always have an hourglass, uh, but instead of it being a bright red, like on black widows, it's going to be more of an orangey color. So if you see the hourglass shape, you know you what you got. Don't worry about the color. If it's red, if it's orange, if it's purple, if you see any spider with purple on it, don't touch it. It's a spider. Don't touch it. Um, all right. So another complication on appearances. Now, um, it's important to note, like I said, not all individuals of a species are going to follow the rules set by general observation. So if I see a hundred spiders and say, these all look identical, so this must be what these look like, and then I see a spider, 101 spider, doesn't look the same, doesn't mean it's not the same species, it just means that there was a mutation or some kind of variation in the pattern, the genes are messed up, something. It can be the same species and not always look the same. So, these descriptions are made to find, based off of what you most commonly find in nature. Uh, these are, there are always exceptions that can be found. For example, uh, there have been populations of the Western Black Widow, uh, normally black females with the hourglass shape on the bottom. Now, there have been populations that don't have that typical black color with the red hourglass. Instead, weirdly enough, these populations have been uh, maintaining the color and patterns that they exhibit during their juvenile state. So, you see them and you think, oh, don't worry about it, it's just a juvenile. No, actually, it's an adult female and it's going to bite you and it's going to hurt. So, once again, don't mess with them, don't touch them. You see a spider, just leave it be. But, um, it's a general rule of thumb. Don't mess with spiders. All right, so those are the female descriptions. Now let's move on to the juvenile or young that aren't fully uh, developed into adulthood. So uh, the juvenile widow spider typically has a much different coloration than the adults. Usually the abdomen is a grayish to black color. Uh, they have white stripes that run across their back, the back of their abdomen, and yellow or orange spots down the center. Uh, male widows, even fully grown, not juvenile, but male widows, can uh, also maintain this juvenile coloration after re reaching adulthood, or they will, like the females, change, but they will change into a more brown or black, just solid, nondescript colors, just sitting over a corner chilling, don't look at me. Um, they will not, a male will not have an hourglass shape, um, but they could have some uh, red markings on their top or bottom of their abdomen from time to time. Like I said, not all individuals within a species will look identical. If that were true, 
Every single human looked the same. Every single dog looked the same. There are differences between individuals, but these are just general observations made of the majority. So uh, now that we know what they look like, let's discuss where they live. All right. In general, widows, widow spiders, black, red, brown, doesn't matter what they are. In general, they will not infest a home. They would prefer to find dark and tight spaces outside. That would be something like inside of a wood pile or underneath some rocks where they can hide up under a spot and build their nest outside of that um, and just chill. Now, if they do come inside, they're going to generally stick to quiet, low traffic locations such as basement corners, uh, crawl spaces under a house, uh, attics, somewhere where people aren't there a lot. But also there has to be prey. Um, because they have a habit of building their webs between a stationary object, such as a box and a wall, they can become a nuisance species in something like a warehouse or storage facility. Just think you got a big... Uh, warehouse and boxes lined up all on the wall and they've been there for six months. You got spiders all behind it. So yeah, the, the nests are going to be pretty much a nuisance because you're going to have spider webs everywhere. Um, really, it's just the spider webs that are, that are the problem. Uh, black widows don't cause any property damage. So in reality, it's just kind of annoying Plus, they're, you know, going to scare everybody. Somebody sees a black widow and they're going to freak out even more than if they just saw a spider. So it's more of a psychological issue along with having to clean up cobwebs. Um, spiders themselves do not cause property damage. I already told you that. Now, in modern times, uh, widow spiders aren't nearly as much of a problem as they used to be. Um, we've made a lot of advancements and they we haven't had to really come into contact with them nearly as much. Now, historically, the most common place where humans would come into contact with the spiders would be in an outhouse. Now, outhouse. You know, you got a bathroom. Instead of a bathroom inside with a flushing toilet, they used to have bathrooms outside with a non-flushing toilet. It's basically a wooden shed with a wooden box with a hole and a pit. And you dig the pit down and that's where you did your business. It had to be away from the house because it's going to stink. Because we didn't have flush toilets. We didn't have indoor plumbing at that point. So we had to go outside to do our business and we would run into insects, all sorts of different problems out there. And one of those Creatures that would inhabit an outhouse was black widows, commonly. Um, an outhouse in the spring and the summer presented a spider with a warm, dark area sheltered from the, the elements. And due to the nature of what people were doing in the outhouse, there's going to be a bunch of bugs in there. So the common place that they would get, this is awful. This is just the worst thing. The most common place that the spiders would make a nest in an outhouse. It's right underneath the toilet seat. Right underneath the toilet seat. So right there, that little space. So when somebody sits down, there's a spider right here. And guess what that spider would do? Oh, somebody's messing with my nest. Come up around the edge and bite somebody's butt. You get a spider bite on your butt. Now, I wouldn't want to deal with that. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. We're moving on. <laughs> All right. So, moving on from there, we've covered what they've looked like and where they live. So, let's move to their life cycle. All right, the life cycle of a black widow spider. Now, a lot of spiders have similar life cycles, but can vary based off of where they are um, and how big they get, amount of uh, amount of prey next to them. So specifically, we'll talk about black widows. Um, now, red widows and brown widows share some of these similarities, but not always. But we'll stick to the western, southern, and northern black widows. 
So let's start the cycle with the laying of eggs. All right, so the female spider will lay her eggs <coughs> in a sac, small little egg sac made of silk. Now this is in a ball shape, just round circular, or it's kind of a teardrop. Um, it's roughly half an inch in diameter, so it's about as big around as she is long. It's pretty big compared to her. Um, now, in each one of these egg sacs, it can contain anywhere from 200 to 400 eggs, and there have even been instances where people have encountered more than that inside, but let's just say that top end is about 400 eggs per egg sac, all right? A single female widow spider has the ability to lay four to nine egg sacs in a single summer. One summer, one summer, and you got one female spider, and she's laying nine egg sacs with 400 eggs in each. You know what that is? That's, I mean, assuming, you know, occasionally there might be more than 400, whatever, but that's nearly 4,000 baby spiders in one summer. One summer, 4,000 spiders from one spider. Imagine how many more spiders there are going to be, especially if none of the babies die. That's infinite. It's ridiculous. It's awful. All right, so after laying the eggs, the massive, massive quantity of awful, awful spider eggs, the female spider will guard the egg sac. So she'll stay in her little web with the little, little egg sac hanging in there. And she'll guard that sac from threats and whatnot. But the main thing that she does when taking care of that is she'll actually detach it from its location and move it to a different spot in the nest because she will base the needs of that egg sac off of temperature and humidity. I mean, if it gets too hot, eggs could die. If it gets too humid, you could get mold in the sacs, in the egg sac, and then the mold will eat away at the eggs, and there you go. There's, there's the end of it. So she's got to keep the temperature and humidity balanced for the eggs. Um, it takes about eight to ten days after she lays the eggs for the eggs to start hatching. Now, despite hatching after just one week, a little over one week, the baby spiders don't come out. They'll stay inside of this egg sac for at least one molting session. So a molting session is basically they hatch, their exoskeletons harden, and then they grow inside of their exoskeleton. So it's like wearing a suit of armor. So if you're wearing a suit of armor and you're 10, when you turn 11 and you hit your growth spurt, you can't wear that same suit of armor. You got to take that suit of armor off and get another one. So that's what spiders do. When they grow inside of their exoskeleton, they got to take off their exoskeleton, split on the back and usually slide out. And then their outsides are soft. Now, when the air hits them, they... The, the chitin, which makes up their exoskeleton, starts to harden on the outside, and their new exoskeleton dries and forms, and they harden up that way. So the baby spiders have to do this once while still inside the sac. So even though eight days later, after being laid, they're hatched, they're just going to be inside of that sac. Now, while inside the sac after the, the, the molting session, um, they'll emerge up to four weeks after they're laid. So that's about, they're laid, a week later they hatch. Within those next three weeks, they do a molt and they grow. And then, boom, here comes the most disturbing fact of this whole video, but yet it's still pretty cool. You ready for this one? I've warned you. When the baby spiders come out of their egg sac, split side, they come pouring out. So you got 400 baby spiders coming out of this little sac, all right? They climb to the high point around them, somewhere where they can get a breeze blowing by. 
they turn around and they shoot a single thread, single thread of silk. Now these are tiny, 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 little itty bitty spiders. So it doesn't take much to pick them up. Single thread up, wind blown by, wind catches the thread and 400 spiders. Gone, floating through the air. That's how they disperse. So that's called ballooning for them. And they basically turn into a cloud of nastiness, a little tiny cloud of death that just floats until they run into a tree or something like that. Can you imagine up to 400 little spiders just floating through the air like a little leggy cloud of creepiness and just imagine if there was more than one sack that hatched. Imagine that nest had two sacks. That's 800. That's twice the size of that cloud. Just standing out in a field somewhere doing whatever, mowing the yard or whatnot and all, and all of a sudden spiders everywhere. <laughs> but the benefit is, is they're just babies. They're not dangerous. It's just gross. Still be pretty awful to get caught up in that. So, all right. So, They've already ballooned, they're floating. Now let's talk about what happens when they land. Once the spiders land, uh, they'll just go about their spidery business. Um, they'll make webs, catch and eat insects, then try to not get eaten by other creatures such as insects, spiders, the like. Um, I mean, remember the juveniles not only have less potent venom, the juvenile females don't have their distinguishing marks. Uh, so there's nothing to warn predators away. So even as they grow, nobody cares. They're going to eat them. Um, just how nature works. Um, now it takes around seven molting sessions after hatching. So the shedding exoskeleton, they got to do it about seven more times for, uh, for a widow spider to reach maturity. So that means... Hatch, blow away, land, and they got to live for seven more sheddings before they're going to be fully developed into adults. And then they can start doing adulting things. Um, the time that it takes for this to happen can vary depending on where they are geographically uh, and the time of year. So say they're in the first egg sack of the season and they get out and they're in an area where there's really nice weather, um, lots of bugs around, the, the whole deal. There's plenty of places for them to make nests. They're gonna catch a lot, they're gonna eat a lot, and they're gonna develop a lot quicker. Um, so it can take as little as three months for uh, these spiders to reach maturity. Um, but like I said, this would only happen under very ideal circumstances, and ideal doesn't always happen. It's not really that common in nature for the ideal situation to happen. There's always something, and there's always something competing with you for those resources. Uh, so it tends to be a little bit slower um, because of the likelihood of a, a spider finding such a perfect ba uh, place with that perfect balance since it's so small. Um, it's generally considered that there's only one generation of spiders per year. So that means that juveniles from the, the previous year emerge from winter, lay their, you know, reach adulthood during the spring, spring, they lay their eggs, eggs hatch and become sub adults by the time winter hits and then they got to go hide. It's not like you got a baby hatched in the spring and then it grows up completely to an adult and then has more babies before the next winter. That's not very common at all. And it's probably unlikely that the babies would even survive over winter without having that little buffer period for them to develop some and find a place to hide over the winter. Um, so because of that, because winter comes generally comes before the spiderlings can reach full adulthood. Um, like I said, they've got to find a place to overwinter. So this could be a nice protected hole under a rock, storage shed, uh, attic, 
whatever. They just go in there and they hide until spring, hoping that they don't freeze outside or that something doesn't come along and eat them or that, you know, somebody doesn't come through and vacuum them up because they found a big little big pile of spiders in a corner somewhere in their attic while they're doing cleaning. Um, once temperatures reach tolerable level, levels in the next spring uh, and their prey become more active, the spiders then leave the overwintering shelters and come, uh, come out so they can continue to develop. Once they start coming out, start eating more, their development begins again and they can finish off their seven molts and then boom, adult spiders. This usually happens around late spring, uh, before summer officially starts in that general time frame. Uh, once they reach maturity and they're adult spiders, then comes the next step in the life cycle. They got to start more. They got to start more generations. So the spiders will go and find a mate. Uh, and then the mate, they mate. Female goes lays eggs. Whole story starts over again. So basically, rewind two minutes and listen to it again. If you really want to hear the life cycle go over and over and over. But I don't recommend it because I'm sure you're smarter than that. Um, now, this is the process. This is the part. The mating is where the part where the widow spider gets her name. Now, a widow is a woman. So this is a name for a human woman that has then been transferred to these spiders. But a widow is a woman that's lost her spouse, so her husband, generally, uh, because he died. Killed at war, killed at sea, whatever. Um, and she hasn't remarried. So that would make her a widow. So... These spiders, the widow spiders, get the name because it was believed that immediately after a male and female spider mate, the female spider would then turn, kill the male, and eat them. But, turns out that this thought that all female widow spiders killed their mates turns out to be wrong. So their name doesn't really quite fit what they actually do. Um, when these spiders were first being researched um, and studied, it wasn't under ideal conditions. Um, the researchers were not looking at the spiders out in the field or in their natural habitats. They weren't going out and lifting rocks and watching spiders. What they were doing was is they were catching the spiders out in the wild and then bringing them back to controlled settings. Now, back then, they weren't trying to recreate the spider's natural habitat. They were just putting them in... Uh, Basically just little containers, like little Tupperware bowls. So that way they could see the spiders and see how the spiders react. And uh, what they were doing was, is the researchers would have a male and a female spider, and they'd put them in the same little Tupperware. And obviously, the male and female spiders, they're going to do what they do naturally. They're going to mate. But because they're still in the same small area right after mating, the female, which is bigger, and she now needs food, She's gonna mis she mistakes the male for her prey, and she ends up eating him. Now, because they're in such a small spot and the males can't get away, the researchers look at this and they're like, oh, hallelujah, eureka, we know more about this spider. We're going to call them widow spiders because every single time we put a male and a female into this tiny Tupperware bowl, the female eats the male, so that just must mean that's what's going on. <sighs> Flawed science. Turns out that during studies done in laboratories that provide larger containment areas to more mirror natural, ha uh, natural habitats or uh, observing spiders in nature, which is the better way to study because then you get a better idea of what's actually happening. Uh, as long as the male spider can get out of the female's web directly after they mate, uh, that's that. The male can survive, obviously, and move on with his little spidery life and do the things he wants to do. Uh, 
females eating males is actually a pretty rare event for the species. Um, now, that is common. I mean, that's that's how it is for a lot of spiders. There does happen to be a closely related spider within the same genus of Lactrodectus, so really closely related to the widow spider, where the female will actually start to eat the male as part of the mating ritual. So during it, the, the female just starts eating him. And if that didn't happen, the mating wouldn't happen. It's part of their ritual. It has to happen every time. And you've got mail. Don't worry about that. Um, the, this spider uh, that does this is the Australian redback spider. So only found in Australia. Noted, note that it's not called a widow spider. It's called a redback spider. Now, these spiders should actually be called the widow spider and not the ones that we have here or even any of the widows because the widowing doesn't actually happen except for in the Australian redback spider. But what are you going to do? They're already named and they're already Latinized with their little uh, special scientific names. Uh, but like I said, it turns out females eating males is pretty uncommon. All right, so we've talked about their classification, what they look like, where they live. I mean, really, most people, when they think about black widows, I think, oh, it's a deadly spider. Oh, it's a deadly spider. So let's talk about the health risks. What happens if you were to get bit? So, first off, I need to reiterate that black widows and widows in general are not really that aggressive in spider standards. I mean, compared to some other species, there are some species that come at you. Widows, they don't. They want nothing to do with you. They want nothing to do with you even if you're in their space most of the time. Um, I mean... Most bites happen when people unknowingly stick their hands into a space um, where the web is, um, like behind a box in a storage unit or um, moving things like rocks and wood outside. Uh, it can also occur if the spider's inside of your clothing or your shoe and you put one of those things on. So like you throw a shirt in a corner and it sits there for a week and then you pick the shirt up a week, you know, after that week and you put it on. Well, if you didn't shake it out, there could be a spider in there and it might bite you because now it's pressed up against you and it really has nowhere to go and it feels threatened. Um, in general though, widow spiders are pretty timid and only bite when threatened. Um, they're so timid in fact that even when disturbing a nest that has an egg sac, it's more likely for that black widow or widow spider in general to run away and just be like, nope, you're too big. I'm done. I'm out. See ya. Peace. I'll go lay eggs over here. So that's something, I mean, it, it's a little reassuring. I mean, you don't have to worry about black widows just kicking down your door and coming in and trying to bite you. But if you do get bitten, uh, the widow's venom uh, can cause a set of symptoms that is known as lat latrodectism. Latrodectism. It's actually an entire set of symptoms. It's like, specifically, it's like having a disease because you got bitten. Um, now, their venom is what's known to be a neurotoxin, uh, which is a type of toxin that's damaging to nerve tissues by altering the structure or function of cells in the nervous system. Um, there's many types of neurotoxin in the world, um, and they can be found from many sources. Uh, Animal-wise, you can find them in snakes, spiders, scorpions, bees, pufferfish, and some shellfish, like mussels and clams. Um, there's also non-animal sources of neurotoxins. Uh, lead, for example, it's a type of metal, but if it gets in your system, 
uh, it's going to be considered a neurotoxin uh, because it's got harmful effects to your uh, nervous system. All right. Um, when it comes to Black Widow uh, and their venom and lactodectrism, lactro, latrodectism, the effects are not immediate. So in many cases, a widow spider can bite you and you won't even know. You won't even feel any pain and can go completely unnoticed. And at worst, the bite's going to feel like somebody poked you. You think you, you know, put your shirt on and got poked by a, by a string or something. So that's something that's not that reassuring because you'd get bit and not know it. So um, from the point of, uh, from the time of the bite, uh, the venom will then travel from the source point of injection to the nervous system and it'll spread through the body via the nervous system. Uh, after around 15 minutes to an hour, uh, depending on the toxicity, as in how much venom got put into you and your body type, like how big you are uh, or any other health issues, um, around 15 minutes to an hour, you'll start to develop the first symptoms. Now, the first symptoms of being bitten, um, just kind of a dull ache, kind of like, oh, that's that spot on my body is sore now. And it's generally around where the bite was. Now, from there, um, I mean, it doesn't seem that bad. Just a dull ache, yeah, you deal with it. Go take some Tylenol. But from there, the ache could spread and uh, progress to something much worse. Uh, it will progress to painful muscle cramps. Now, you're thinking, oh, Charlie Horse. No, this is worse because it goes to all your large muscle groups. Now, it's spread through your nervous system at this point, so it's in your body. Um, so it's going to travel to the nerves that affect the larger muscle groups, such as in your abdomen. And that's where you're going to get your cramps. Your big, big muscles are going to like that, and you're going to feel horrible. And that's not even where it stops. So, after that, the other symptoms involved with getting bit are sweating. Yeah, nausea. Now, that could be pretty bad. Elevated blood pressure. That, that's not good. Now, the last one doesn't seem that bad, but it is because I hate doing it. It's vomiting. So if you think you get bit by a spider and you start to throw up, you got an issue. Just remember that one. Um, these symptoms, all of the ones above, are going to reach their peak or the point at which they are not going to get any worse because they're as bad as they're going to get after anywhere from one to three hours. So you get bit 15 minutes later, oh, kind of hurts a little bit. Hour later, you're on the floor because your stomach's cramped up, you're sweating and puking all over yourself and you just don't feel great. Here comes the good news, which isn't actually good news. So at one hour you feel that way, up to three hours you're gonna get worse and at three hours, it stops. It doesn't stop. It stops getting worse. So you feel just as bad as you did for the next nine to 21 hours. So you could be dealing with this for an entire day of just awfulness. That's what would happen if you get bit. Now, here comes the good news. After up to 24 hours, your body will start to break down that neurotoxin and remove it from your system. So 24 hour hits and you're all clenched up and you haven't had anything worse happen to you in 12 hours or so, you're going to start to get better. Your body will break down the neurotoxin, remove it, repair any damage, and you'll just pee out the byproducts of the broken down neurotoxin. Um, in some extremely rare cases, extremely rare cases, um, 
by extremely rare, I mean around less, less than, less than 1% of people that get bitten, death could occur. Um, in most cases, healthy adult, you'll feel the mild symptoms from being bitten. Um, if you're not a healthy adult and you're an unhealthy adult, you're probably going to feel more severe symptoms. Uh, the most at risk are small children, obviously, with anything, whether it's a disease, a poison, a venom, whatever. Small children are most susceptible. Now, along with that, elderly. Older people that have reached the point where their immune system isn't working as well. And also unhealthy adults that don't have that have a suppressed immune system they're the ones that are going to be affected so if they're bitten they need to get to a hospital everyone else you probably should still go to a hospital but you're not going to have to worry about dying that's good to know um Modern fatalities from the black widow bite occurs, like I said, in less than 1% of every person that gets bitten. This means that the odds of somebody, specifically a healthy adult, the odds of a healthy adult dying from a black widow bite are around just as low as a chance of you getting hit by lightning. Yeah. Now, how many times have you walked around outside and not gotten hit by lightning? How many times have you held a black widow spider? I'd say that you're doing pretty good on that. You're more likely to get hit by lightning in those instances if you spend more time outside and you don't ever touch a black widow. So that's something to feel good about. But even though I still feel good about it, I'd still avoid messing with these spiders so that you don't have to risk the situation and you don't have to risk being going through the pain and discomfort that would happen while the neurotoxins in your body. If you ever find yourself, this is important. This is for Chucky. This is for anybody, anybody watching. Important. Do not forget it. This is for myself as well. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you believe that you've been bitten by a black widow spider, seek medical help. Just in case, you, you just, you got to. It's better to be safe than sorry. Or in this case, it is better to be safe than in pain than dead. I mean, that's, that's just common sense. You get bitten by a spider and you know it might be poisonous. Or, there you go. It might be venomous. Even though all spiders, if they bite, they're going to be venomous. If it could be harmful to humans, clarification on the clarification. If you get bitten by a spider and it could be harmful to humans, harmful to your health, or put you through a situation, go get help. That's me being an adult, being responsible, and trying to teach a younger generation not to be like me when I was younger. So, all right. That was a lot of information, and it took a lot longer than I thought it would, but we got through it, and I hope you stuck it out with me and enjoyed the video. Uh, I have to say, still kind of creeped out by the thought of a death cloud of tiny little spiders uh, just falling on me, just outlining my business from the sky, just, but... Like being bitten or being struck by lightning. I haven't encountered a death cloud so far in my life. So I'll probably be all right. Okay. At this point, Chuck. You haven't told me what the next video you want is going to be about. You need to let me know. So you can put a comment on this video. Or you can... Call me, text me, video message me, whatever you want to do. Um, you just let me know, and I'll get to work. Uh, this video took a couple of days uh, to get all everything in line, and I still have to edit and upload after this. So today is Friday. It could be Sunday by the time I get this up. Either way, you got to let me know, or I can't make the video. Um, as
as of this point right now, I've already got one Minecraft Survival episode uh, up. It's a little over a half hour long. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen it yet because I haven't talked to you. Um, but whatever. I'll get another one of those done and post it, I'm, I want to say, by Tuesday-ish. So by the time that, you know, by the time I talk to you next, you know, there'll definitely be a video up. Um, but other than the Minecraft thing, which is pretty easy to do, uh, you just got to come up with some show ideas for this show. This show right here. You got to get ideas for me. Uh, whatever you want to learn about. You said Black Widows. Here's your Black Widows. You want to learn about any other animal. I don't care what it is. I'll do a whole thing on it. You want to learn about space. Pick a star. I'll tell you about it. I mean, most stars are pretty much the same. But you tell me a topic, I'll do it. It doesn't even have to be just one topic. You come up with a list and send me that list, and I will I will work through it as best as I can from one to whatever number you give me, and I'll get them up here eventually. And But past that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope anyone else that eventually sees this enjoyed this video. I don't know that anyone would ever watch this, but thank you. Let's go with that. Um, that's all I got. I will talk to you later. See ya.